Morning, church. Let my people go. Exodus 5, verse 1. Moses and Pharaoh. That's the way that Moses thundered to Pharaoh. In a period of severe famine, the Hebrew peoples had gone down into Egypt. They had multiplied until the Egyptians felt threatened. In due course, they enslaved them. Centuries passed. Their values were changing. And from the spiritually alive among them, their cry went up. God heard and sent a deliverer. And through Moses, he confronted Pharaoh. The people were freed, and a mighty deliverance was wrought. Do you remember Moses' prophecy? It's in Deuteronomy 18, if you'd like to turn there. Deuteronomy 18, the one I'm referring to and thinking of here. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. This was Moses, one of the very early prophecies about Jesus. This is what Moses said. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me in your midst from your brethren. Him you shall hear. We don't often think of Jesus in the prophetic mode, but Jesus was certainly among the many things that he was. He is also a prophet. In fact, the Bible, in the Bible, this prophecy is applied to Christ in Acts 3.22, and it's also applied in Acts 7.37, that Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy by Moses. Moses was a precursor. He was a pre-deliverer. Jesus is the ultimate deliverer. Jesus is the ultimate Moses. Oppressors, oppression is always searching for subjects. It's true. When there is power without other love, self-loving agents are on the hunt. And they are pushing and squeezing and looking for ways to press down, to suppress, and to oppress. Self-love looks for people to tear down into objects. It searches for people that it can measure itself against and then use those people for its own ends. Oppression never has its source in God's kingdom, but it always has its source in Satan's kingdom. There are only two springs a spring of life flowing from God, where we can call other love. And there is a spring of death flowing from nowhere higher than Satan, and we can call that the spring of self-love. Other love and self-love, two kinds of love. Everything sort of boils down into those two pieces. Converted people drink from the other love category, but the human default, I'm sad to say, but we all know it, the human default is unconversion, self-love, and therefore it is the liquor of the spring of death. That's the most common. When you interact with others, it's always from one or the other of these terms. You are free, you are other loving, you are secure in Christ, and you're not wandering through the earth in search of people to oppress, or you're a self-loving, insecure person wandering through life, endlessly setting up stepladders to make you bigger than you are. You're one of those two. This is nothing new. Men sinned, and God washed the earth with a flood. But not long after that, humans diverged again into these same two streams. One group journeyed from the east and came to the plain of Shinar. There they built themselves a city and a tower. This is Genesis 11. And it wasn't just a two-story tower. They built themselves a tower whose top reached into the heavens. I believe they must have made it as high as they thought they could at that time or attempted to make it that way. Their motivation was clear. They sought to make a name for themselves. This was not rooted in other love, but it was rooted in self-love. 
And there was manifest this tired, restless, hopeless project of God making. And they were, would like to make themselves basically be the gods. Men weren't satisfied with the God of heaven and other love, so they made carnival mirrors for themselves to look larger than life to themselves. And while this was relatively new to earth, it was not new to the universe, the angels had seen it before. Lucifer had embarked on this strange path when he turned against God without cause and remade himself into Satan, the, God's adversary. After Satan led Adam and Eve astray, this wandering, restless, bent-up, catastrophic search for bigness at the expense of others, that became the default human position. You've seen it at work. You've seen it in your family, probably. You've seen it sometimes, God forbid, but sometimes in your church. Attempts to go against God's ways and to usurp his authority with our own human authority. You see it in movements in the culture. Movements which try to overwrite God's design for humans. You see it in the news. You see it in the rules handed down to force others to go against their conscience. You see it in men building bigger rockets, bigger buildings, faster cars, acquiring more money, more power in bombings, killing, shootings, and even in petty robberies. The terrible fruit of self-love rumbles through the world, leaving in its wake damaged people, broken lives, crushed hearts, hopelessness, and despair. But the towers men build are never tall enough. The power they exert over others is never satisfying enough. Always restless self-love is unsatisfied because men cannot become gods or even junior gods. Humans are humans and we're never designed to build towers and carnival mirrors enlarging ourselves to ourselves. We were designed, we were designed for other love. We come under oppression in two ways. Either we walk into it, or it comes to us. But it's always coming. When God's people were unfaithful, the Babylonians came to them. They invaded, and off they were carted to captivity. When God's people went to Egypt, eventually they were oppressed in Egypt. For a time, there was an opportunity to walk out, but when that door closed, they were trapped then under Egyptian boots, and then they spent centuries enslaved, making bricks. God made us in his image. He made us with a likeness to the divine. He designed us to be free. He designed us to exercise agency. You've heard this again and again, but uh, you're going to hear it again and again, I think. Steps to Christ, page 48, uh, just a sublime one-line statement, so true, so important. The power of choice God has given to men, it is theirs to exercise. I believe that's true, don't you? God gave you choice, and he wants you to use that choice. We have been granted liberty. We exist within a moral framework. There is right and wrong. We can choose right or wrong. Some of our choices are morally indifferent. To select one color of toothbrush is not a more more moral choice than to select another color. But for us to compel action in others is to override their choice. It is to deny them their freedom. God gives freedom, and I would say even this, it is essential to our divinely given human nature to exercise choice. A person who is just doing every single push thing they're pushed and forced and squeezed to do is being dehumanized, and God is angered when that happens. Paul outlines the principle over here if you want to turn to it at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, the same piece here. In Romans 6 and verse 16, in 
and very crucial principle. Do you not know? Which is an interesting way to start a statement, isn't it? In other words, you should know. We all should know this. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves servants or slaves to obey, doulos in Greek, you are that one's servants or slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. A key, key principle. And by the way, you can flip ahead to John 15. We're going there next in the scriptures when we get there eventually to it. But uh, John 15. But think about this verse here, Romans 6. To do what is wrong is to engage in the self-love principle. And to do what is right is to engage in the other love principle. God does not force. He does not compel. Satan uses force to compel. God does not oppress, but Satan oppresses. Oppression is always searching for us. There are degrees of oppression. Sometimes oppression is merely authoritarian, right? Comply with our demands on category A stuff and do whatever you want with category B stuff. Sometimes it's just authoritarian. Other times it's totalitarian. Totalitarian, it covers everything. We control category A and category B, and you must comply with all our directives, both in category A and category B. That's totalitarian, everything. You do everything the way we say it. Different kinds of oppression. There are different strategies for creating conformity. I'm sorry, but this last year, it's been a year to be quoting from George Orwell. And I'm going to quote from him again. He wrote this novel, 1984. It's really a dystopia, a utopian vision of the future gone wrong. And in his book, the people are under an oppressive surveillance state. They're watched everywhere. The police use force. The, poli the state tortures people. And I think one quote, I don't have it here, but one thing he said, uh, that what it was like, it's like... Uh, a continuous presence in which the state is always right. No, a, a continuous presence in which the party is always right. That was the quote. And that reminds me of the news when I watch it. Yeah, it's, a conti it's always continuing. And so, and... But there were two major uh, well-known dystopias. One is Orwell's 1984, but there's a second one. And it's Aldous Huxley who wrote Brave New World. A picture of the future. In Huxley's Brave New World, people are, people are technocratically engineered. One place in the book, they're called standard men and women in uniform batches. Children are raised in bottles and specialized chemical soups. Conditioned to like their infinitely dull world, the government provides constant entertainment, free drugs, free drugs all around from the government, contraceptives are free, and uh, sexual immorality is required. It, it, the morality is completely inverted in this, in this world. And the, there's one of the main, two of the main figures in this story, this terrible story, are the controller who kind of runs the world, planet Earth, and John, who is a a savage, he was a person who was on an uncivilized area that's not under the control of everything else. And he comes and comes into the, into the, um, into the civilized, I guess we would say, place. And uh, Aldous Huxley, go back here. I messed it all up here. Here we go. Not that. So let me give you a little snippet of conversation from this. John, but I like the conveniences. So they're talking, it's near the end of the story, John is speaking with the controller about all the inconveniences that have been removed from life. So here it goes. John, he says to the other guy, but I like the inconveniences. The controller says, we don't. We prefer to do things comfortably. John, but I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom. I want goodness. I want sin. Controller. 
In fact, you're claiming the right to be unhappy. John, all right then, I am claiming the right to be unhappy. Controller, not to mention the right to grow old and ugly and impotent, the right to have syphilis and cancer, the right to have too little to eat, the right to be lousy, the right to live in constant apprehension of what may happen tomorrow, the right to catch typhoid, the right to be tortured by unspeakable pains of every kind. Then there was a long silence and John thought about that and finally John said, he said, I claim them all. Orwell's society was about power. It shouted few pretenses about the greater good. Huxley's world emphasized sensory experience and a kind of superficial happiness for the collective. And some people are saying today we're living in a combination of George Orwell and, and Huxley. It kind of seems that way. These guys both lived, they both wrote in the 1940s. And in 1949, Aldous Huxley, who wrote The Brave New World, wrote a letter to George Orwell. And this is what he said. Within the next generation, I believe that the world's rulers will discover that infant conditioning and narco-hypnosis are more efficient as instruments of government than clubs and prisons, and that the lust for power can be just as easily satisfied, now listen to this, the lust for power can be just as easily satisfied by suggesting people into loving their servitude as by flogging and kicking them into, dis, into obedience. God gave us free choice. It's free choice against a moral backdrop, however. Free choice in the setting of right and wrong. Then aren't all of our choices rooted in the one stream or the other? Aren't all of our choices either choices to other love, like when Jesus himself died for, died for us on the cross? That's other love. Or our choices are self-love, like when Satan sought the worship of men and angels. Self-love. Everything kind of goes into those two, those two streams. Everything comes from those two streams. And I'm sad to say, I believe that Huxley was on to something when he warned us that suggesting people into loving their servitude was the way things would go. Rod Dreher, from a Christian perspective, he wrote this uh, prescient 2020 book, Live Not By Lies. I may have mentioned it here before. He says we're descending into a soft totalitarianism. According to Dreher, let me give you an extended quote from his book. We want, we're talking about things in the word of God, but we're also looking at the, what's happening this moment around us. Here's what Dreher says. Soft totalitarianism exploits decadent modern man's preference for personal pleasure over principles, including political liberties. The public will support or at least not oppose the coming soft totalitarianism, not because it fears the imposition of cruel punishments, but because it will be more or less satisfied by hedonistic comforts. He goes on to say, the death of God in the West now, in the 1960s, by the way, there was a movement called the Death of God. And all these intellectuals said, well, Christianity's dying in the West, and, and so they called it the Death of God movement. So he's referring to that. The Death of God in the West had given birth to a new civilization devoted to liberating the individual to seek his own pleasures and to managing emergent anxieties. And then he says this. This was a revolution even more radical than the 1917 Bolshevik event. Now, you know, you know, what, the 19, that, you know what that is, right? That's the communist that became the communist revolution that resulted in the rise of the Soviet Union. So then he says this. For the first time, for the first time, humankind was seeking to create a civilization based on the negation of any binding transcendent order. The Bolsheviks may have been godless, but even they believed that there was a metaphysical order, one that demanded that individuals subordinate their personal desires to a higher cause. And then he says this. This is all on pages 10 to 13. 
this last line, relatively few contemporary Christians are prepared to suffer for their faith because the therapeutic society that has, that has formed them denies the purpose of suffering in the first place in the idea of bearing pain for the sake of truth seems ridiculous. People give up their liberties, friends, under delusion. And the West today is immersed in delusions. Over on page 15, two pages later, he says this. One more quote from, from him. Under soft totalitarianism, the media, academia, corporate America, and other institutions are practicing newspeak and compelling the rest of us to engage in doublethink every day. Men have periods. The woman standing in front of you is to be called he. Diversity and inclusion means excluding those who object to ideological uniformity. Equity means treating persons unequally, regardless of their skills and achievements, to achieve an ideologically correct result. Absolutely nailed it. I wished he hadn't. Somebody said this, the urge to save humanity is almost always a false face for the urge to rule it. I think he was talking, that person who said that, I think he was talking about self-love. Language is more dangerous than bullets because language permits us to compromise for a bargain price. Jesus told us there's an irrepressible conflict between other love and self-love. In fact, over at John 15, verses 18 and 19, Listen to what now Jesus says. If there's a specialist on other love, it's Jesus. He's talking to his disciples, and of course you and I today are his disciples today, so we should listen up. Here's what Jesus says. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. See, we are not of the world because we are engaged in other love. We're a resistance force against self-love promoting other love. The world is on this default plan of self-love, and conflict between these two principles is, is inevitable. 1 Corinthians 13, you all know that, the love chapter, right? Well, in verses 4 to 8, the first part of verse 8, I'm going to read that through with you. I'm going to just, instead of saying love, I'm going to, I'm going to be more particular. I'm going to say other love. Yeah. Listen to this. You all know this. Other love suffers long and is kind. Other love does not envy. Other love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Other love never fails. Other love or self-love? Oh, you could turn to Isaiah 53 because before we're done, we're going there too. But what we have here at 1 Corinthians, other love is described by Paul... As he describes it, other love does not oppress. But self-love seeks its own, and it fails as it did when Satan chose not to love the one who had created him pure. Satan did his utmost to lead men to murder Jesus at Calvary. What was that? That was self-love. Self-love is the denial of liberty to others and the denial of glory to God. It takes everything to itself. Self goes first. 
And so self-love never says, hey, I'll split this banana with you. But instead it says, that I'm going to take that banana from you by force and I'm going to eat all of it. It says you must be restricted so that I can live. You'll be restricted so I can live. Self-love. Other love says I will die so that you can live. And of course that was Jesus on the cross. But also at the cross, Satan's self-love said to Jesus, you must die because your other love will prevent me from my oppressions. Other love stands in my way. And so at the cross, both love and other love and self-love spoke. One was murdering and one was loving. Oppression is always searching for subjects to turn into objects. Now all this brings us near the finish. And I'm going to talk about something here for a minute that's kind of current, it's kind of always a subtext right now, and I just want to make sure I'm clear before I, I go there. All right? If you weigh the facts as you understand them, and many of you have, if you weigh the facts as you understand them and you choose to be vaccinated, I support you. I completely support you. If you weigh the facts as you understand them and choose not to be vaccinated, again, I completely support you. You are a free agent, so exercise your choice and try to be right. That's all I ask. That's all you would ask of me, and that's all I would ask of you. Now, this isn't the main point here, but there was a recent article in uh, our union paper, and it stirred up a lot of frustration because uh, of, if it doesn't really matter who it is, but I'm going to quote from it. It's an article in the Lake Union Herald, and in that article, a religious liberty expert wrote that he was not arguing for mandatory vaccinations, but this is what he said. Your choice not to be vaccinated he says, I'm not arguing for mandatory vaccinations, but he said, your choice not to be vaccinated will appropriately come with limitations on community participation, work, and travel. He said, you cannot fairly decry these limits as violations of fundamental Protestant principles of freedom once you understand their true history and nature, and even the more fundamental right of your neighbors and friends to stay alive. So that's a quote of what he said. This same article, by the way, was just reprinted in the Adventist Review. And the, he added, they added a line about the Constitution protects our rights. And, uh, but it doesn't fundamentally change what he says here. What is he saying here? The author is accepting coercion because his article still affirms it as being appropriate, these threatened limitations to community participation, work, and travel. But we must ask, when is it appropriate to deprive people of the right to liberty? Must we actually balance one person's right to liberty but again, defined here quite particularly, community participation, work, and travel. Must we balance one person's rights to that against another person's right to life? Are those God-given natural rights merely tags in a zero-sum game needing to be weighed and balanced by, you know, maybe lawyers dressed in black robes or doctors wearing white lab coats? And really... How does the author of that article know that one person's informed refusal to be vaccinated will kill his neighbor? He doesn't know that. And why stop here? What if my neighbor needs more from me than my being vaccinated? Perhaps he needs an organ transplant. Maybe he's smoked until he had cancer and he needs one of my lungs to live. 
If I refuse to give him one of my lungs, should my community participation, my work, and my travel maybe be appropriately limited? Or maybe he needs a lung from my wife. You know, mine's not compatible. Or maybe he needs a lung from my child. Where do you stop? Or maybe he needs some of my money to pay for cancer treatments, you know. Then there's also this sticky issue of race. As soon as we agree that there is an appropriate limitation of people's rights, because supposedly they should be vaccinated in order to keep others alive, what about groups who maybe are less convinced about receiving the vaccine? So now statistically, African Americans are among groups having the lowest rates of vaccination. Now, if you know some history, you might understand some of the reasons why there might be some concern there. People have been experimented, have experimented on other people. I'm not going to go there, but it's, it's, you can understand it if you understand that background. Now, listen, are we really willing to say that it's appropriate to limit the community participation, the work and travel, say, of African Americans who choose not to be vaccinated? Do we really want to say that? See, once we agree with the concept of appropriately limiting our own rights based on unproven assertions that someone might die, we are already trapped in the spell about which Huxley warned. Have we not then taken the bait and exchanged our freedom for the odious principle of suggesting ourselves into loving our own servitude? I stand with John, I guess, in Brave New World when he said, I want freedom. I want the right to be unhappy. You know, that's where the founders of the American Republic stood. When Thomas Jefferson said, quote, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants, unquote. I sadly think he might be right. Self-love continues in its unrest always to stalk the land in search of other love people to suppress. Jefferson was never more right than when he affirmed, I prefer dangerous freedom over peaceful slavery. You know, we're already far down the not very primrose path. This fella is uh, Rizard Legutko. I read his book. He is a member of the, uh, has been a member of the European Parliament. He's a professor of uh, philosophy. I believe it's Poland he's from, and he serves in the European Union, and uh, he's a thorn in a lot of people's side. But he wrote an interesting book called The Demon in Democracy and uh, totalitarian temptations in free societies. And I'm going to give you one last long quote from him uh, before we carry on toward the end here. But what's interesting was he's looking at the remarkable changes in Poland after communism. Okay, so Poland was under the thumb of communist leadership for for long, long time. We, after the, everything collapsed in the Soviet Union, they are now in freedom, wonderful, wonderful Western liberal freedom following that time. Now, what does he say happens next? Listen to this. And by the way, like a Dreyer, uh, Legutko is also coming at this from a more of a Christian perspective. Listen to this. If we had seatbelts, I'd say, put your seatbelt on. If the old communist lived long enough to see the world of today. They would be devastated by the contrast between how little they themselves had managed to achieve in their anti-religious war and how successful the liberal Democrats have been. Now he's talking about a, a political party, a group of people in, in Poland. So how much it applies here, I'm not trying to say. Let me finish the quotation. All the objectives the communists set for themselves and which they pursued with savage brutality were achieved by the liberal Democrats who almost without any effort and simply by allowing people to drift along with the flow of modernity succeeded 
in converting churches into museums, restaurants, and public buildings, secularizing entire societies, making secularism the militant ideology, pushing religion to the sidelines, pressing the clergy into docility, and inspiring powerful mass culture with a strong anti-religious bias. And Legutko is saying to us, what communism labored and was brutally killing and murdering to achieve for decades and did very little of actually. What communism urgently tried to do, he said, after we flipped over and got our freedom, we're basically, all that has more or less been achieved under freedom, not under communism. He says the decadence of today was, is destroying the religious parts of the society there today, now that they're out from under communism. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you've heard of him. He wrote this book, famous book, The Cost of Discipleship. He was a German Lutheran pastor, and when, when uh, Hitler was elected, he actually went back to Germany to fight for his people, not to literally fight, but he was trying to preserve the spirituality of Christians in Germany. And he was executed a few weeks before the very end of the war by Hitler. But he said this. There he is. This is what he said within uh, 24 hours, I think, of Hitler being elected. The fearful danger of the present time is that above the cry for authority, we forget that man stands alone before the ultimate authority and that anyone who lays violent hands on man here is infringing eternal laws and taking upon himself superhuman authority which will eventually crush him. When we coerce others, we are taking upon ourselves superhuman authority, divine and not human authority. We are transgressing into God's space. Most of you maybe perhaps know what this is, maybe some of you don't. It's a widely known story in today's world as a science fiction show called Star Trek. These are a band of humans and other human-like races who travel among the stars in spaceships. They encounter friendly and unfriendly civilizations. One group they encountered was the Borg, as in the word cyborg, okay? They're like part machine and part human, or part whatever, they're, whatever they, that race is. So now this is a ruthless race that assimilates members of other races into its hive mind collective. Every assimilated person undergoes involuntary medical and technological interventions. All individual freedom is removed and each person does exactly what they're told and has no private thoughts or opinions. All individual freedoms removed. When they encounter you, they tell you that resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. This image is a picture of Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the Starship Enterprise. Uh, he got assimilated along the way. Fortunately, his heroic crew were able to save him and unassimilate him. But anyway, the idea of the Borg was a terrifying idea. People were basically reduced to a zombie-like state and became walking auto automatons. They were medically altered, completely surveilled because you don't have any private thoughts, you're kind of networked in and all of your thoughts are heard by everybody. So they're medically altered, they're completely surveilled, and they do exactly what they're told, and they're incapable of free thought and action. Borgified humans are just a fiction, thankfully, for now. But they represent the complete reduction of the human to the object. They are completely subjugated, all free agency is removed, they are completely victimized by an overlording collectivity. They are the perfect opposite of other love. They came up with that idea. And so, it's familiar to people. And we don't want that, do we? Well, we want to finish on a positive note. But I think these are very intense times. And when we allow our choice to be taken over by others, we get into a very troubled spot. I want to finish with Jesus. 
We very easily revert to oppressor behavior, even when we've known better. We revert to self-love when we ought to be doing other love. In fact, I would say we are still blind after all these years. So I want to return to that early prophecy by Moses, you know, where he made clear that Jesus is the ultimate Moses. Jesus is the ultimate deliverer. Jesus is the ultimate model, and he is the, the example, the preeminent example of other love. Jesus, the innocent, interposed himself between us and forever death. He received the punishment that was rightly ours and gives to us the life that is rightly his. His sacrifice for us not only fulfills the penalty, but is transformative. And Isaiah 53 uh, tells us all about this other love. Let's just think about it for a moment together as we conclude. Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. You know what this is? This is other love. Other love. Jesus gives for us. Other love brings us back from the brink. It respects and seeks our choice and consent. It heals the conscience rather than crushing it. Self-love crushes freedom. Other love nurtures freedom. The example of Jesus is the example of other love. He is the human example. He is the Jesus we follow, deliverer from all oppression. He is the light. and We are to be children of light. And we are to be children of other love. But the forces swirling all around us today are forces to push us down, press us down, squeeze us down, coerce, take away our choice. And it's amazing to me, even well-meaning people, I'm sure, and again, what our choices are in some of these different things, I support you either way. But in terms of taking away somebody's freedom, I'm, I don't think we can go there and be other love people. May God be our helper and guide as we see self-love destroying freedom and putting at risk putting at risk the civilization that we presently have very speedily. May Jesus be our helper and may he come soon. And may we be people of other love and not people in any which way of self-love.